Cryptographic primitives like block ciphers, hash functions, and max. They state we should also standardize as well compositions of such primitives. If carefully crafted, and that's the really juicy phrase, it should kill a lot of attacks. Now, managers can start reading in section 6 to the end. That's a plain English, very good description of what he's getting at. The tough parts, uh, the techies can read and get down to section 6 and blast through that as well. But the basic message is that you can do wrappers around cryptography with protocols to control it, offering a more benign surface to the using system. And if those are specified in standards, it makes it easier for the implementer just to plug and play, pick them up and put them in, and not leave openings for side channel attacks and other sorts of things which are embarrassing, or 900 effects, or the other thing that you mentioned. Uh, I forget at the moment, but many of these things were flaws in implementation, not necessarily with the underlying crypto by itself. All right? And finally, a last paper by Neil Koblitz and Alfred Menendez, The Brave New World of Bodacious Assumptions in Cryptography. <laughs> it's published in the notices of the AMS, the March 2010 issue, emerging soon. They mainly discuss, and their point is that proofs of security, even if valid, may deliver less than they seem to, sometimes much less. The interpretation is subtle. It's a cautionary tale, and again, something that managers and implementers need to read. I'm not trying to say proofs are bad. Boy, we need them. It gives you a basis to start. If you don't have one, why even try to start? But they are not sufficient. Make sure you understand the limiting things they're offering, not heaven on earth, and that it still matters, the implementation, as the Norwegians demonstrated. If you don't build it right, give up. Okay? Uh, there were several other topics that I thought were of interest that I'd like to hit on, just interesting news quips that came out. Uh, you are fully aware that botnets are out there going after PCs. You should now be aware with the reason we're coming out that they're also going after modems and routers. So they can, don't even have to call into the machine at all. They can control who you see and what uh, name servers you go to from the router. That's frightening, and it's very compelling work. Uh, additional areas like this, what else can be falling? Not yet, but we're all beginning to use iPhones and other mobile devices for transactions, the mobile device is becoming much more powerful and complex. That makes it very juicy as a target. Malware is already beginning to show up for these instruments. So whole new pieces of the technology spectrum we depend upon are now subject to malware. The situation is getting worse, not better. And I'll say more in later sessions on how we can try to get out of this mess. But it is getting worse and not better, folks. And candidly, uh, I find it fascinating, my last point, DARPA, nice stogy research process with the Defense Department, hired a hacker, Mudge, and gave him a nice budget and authority as a program manager to come up with a new research agenda. I like that. That's charming, that that culture could go that far, bending that way. I like Mudge. He's very aggressive and has nice thoughts and has a different point of view in getting there. I have high hopes. There's also, of course, high risk. This could be a collision made in hell, and he'll get fired soon. I don't know. But I have great hopes for it, and I think it was a good play on the part of DARPA. End of comments. Thank you very much, Brian. I thought it might be interesting for our audience this year to hear a little bit about your working methods. And you're all, of course, rightly regarded as some of the most important sages in our community. Um, back to a true story, a few years ago I was uh, in the Louvre, in the part of the museum where they have the busts of ancient Greek philosophers, uh, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and so forth. And I'm looking at these bearded sages, and suddenly one of them steps forward and says hello to me and shakes my hand. And it's Ron Rivest. <laughs> so I don't know if Ron was on display in the museum that day or what was going on. Um, but seriously, you all have important roles among the wise women and wise men of our community. So let me ask you, have you ever done anything foolish? And has your doing something foolish in the end actually turned out to be a wise thing? Who'd like to be bold enough to field that question first? I've rarely done anything else. <laughs> uh. One of, my, one of my favorite talks is The Wisdom of Foolishness, and uh, I, used, I start off by saying you've invited me here today because of my reputation in cryptography, and the irony is that while no one wants to appear foolish, particularly in a, a place like Stanford, I got here and you invited me because I did something literally all my colleagues told me was foolish, which was to work in cryptography 
back in the early 70s, uh, and until we had good results, uh, that was the uniform um, uh, attitude, and they had two very good reasons. NSA had a humongous budget, we didn't know how big in those days. Uh, they've been working on it for decades, how can you hope to discover anything they don't already know? And if you do anything good, they'll classify it. And both arguments came back to haunt us later. Uh, the, the first one m more related with the GCHQ uh, claims and, and information. And uh, the, the one, in they'll classify it, uh, there was a conference in October 77 at Cornell where on the advice of Stanford's general counsel, uh, I gave the papers instead of uh, two of my students because we, there was some concern we might be arrested for uh, delivering the papers. And yet, in hindsight, you'd have to say it was very wise uh, to be foolish. And again, like what I'd say, I've hardly done anything else. It's, that's the way you really do good work, is to do things that are foolish. And most of the time, they don't work out. But occasionally, you hit a, what I call a fool home run. I think in the sake of precision, it ought to be pointed out that the law we were being threatened with um, at, at, at Cornell, and incidentally, I went out of the way, I didn't have a paper scheduled, I went out of the way to give a, a rump uh, session talk uh, with thumb on nose uh, because I was younger and more foolish, but the law we were being threatened with was export control. Uh, classification, except in the atomic energy area, doesn't purport to grow out of anything except contractual arrangements. Mm -hmm. There, there is a, a, a style of foolishness which goes on in the theory community, which I think has, has some wisdom behind it, too. We often assume that uh, what we know now is, is the best that can be done. Uh, P is not equal to NP because we don't know how to solve any problem in NP. Or we think this problem will take uh, 40 quadrillion years because we don't know any better, you know, or things like this. So I think, I think it's helpful to, to, to make foolish assumptions like that explicitly uh, to know when you're basing a crypto system on some assumption that, you know, we're just, you know, we, we don't think we can do better than this, and it crystallizes an open problem for somebody to solve. And that's a kind of foolishness which I think has, has merit. Uh, it's, it's often wrong. We, we often find better algorithms, as, as we just saw with the knapsack algorithm or the, the factoring algorithms. Uh, but uh, one has to be foolish and step out there and say, well, let, let's draw the line here and say, if this is the best we can do, then we can leverage it this way in the in cryptographic purposes. I uh, did a quick mental calculation, and I have to admit that I'm about 99% full, because every morning, you know, as a scientist, I go to my office, and I decide to work on a hopeless problem, something which uh, people have uh, looked at for many, many years without success, something which is a very, very long shot, and uh, about once every three months, 100 days or so, I have a good idea, but uh, in the other 99 days, I uh, come in the morning, I decide to work on something, and I make no headway whatsoever. And uh, that's uh, just normal and in our profession. And uh, surprisingly, I'm sure that my employer could have hired someone who would be 100% uh, wise. Every morning, he will set himself such uh, uh, simple tasks that he will succeed at the end of the day in achieving whatever he uh, set uh, to do. And for some reason, they prefer me over the other guy. <laughs> I'm going to ch cheat. I'll change the question a little bit. Rather than myself, which is boring, I'd like to talk about the government, if not being foolish, possibly taking an unmerited risk or an uncalibrated risk, something they weren't really aware of. I'd like to go back and talk about the AES competition that selected Rindal as a winner. I believe that's the right answer. It was a good choice. I have no qualms with the result whatsoever, but I think it has a strong factor of luck in it as well as being right. And the basis for this is review the process, how it happened. AS started, very brief history here, with a conference where 15 people stood up describing their candidates and the audience got a chance to take shots back. It was a social process. Some comments would be, oh, you look good. Others would be, you're too fat. Another one would be, you're too slow. Or, I have an attack and these bullets would be spent, and typically it's a nice social process among humans thumping their chest. That candidate would be dead on the floor. That's it. Five finalists went beyond that point. Rindahl was one of them. In a short period of time, about a year after that, it was announced as the winner after further review, and less than a year after that, something was announced called the BES, the Big Encryption Standard or System Big whatever attack. System. All right? And the the crypto world became very nervous, for those of you who remember. My God, do we have a dead standard on our hands? Do we really cook our goose? 
That's not the flaw I want to talk about, because it wasn't. 